mediation. And it's kind of like a pretty interesting uh, project, especially for, for students to be able to see. I guess they took all, all the, the brown paper waste uh, and the new oyster mushrooms. So um, great thing to do, pretty easy project to do, but definitely those results are pretty priceless. Since then, he's been definitely thinking outside the box. He's doing both professional and personal research and humble relations about uh, dying with some of these mushrooms. It's pretty incredible stuff. Um, he runs the laboratory, or he runs a laboratory at the University of Oregon, where he's been with the Fungal Association with Luke Cutter Ant, uh, among other special interest projects. He's also on the leading edge of fluorescent microscopy using the fairly new science. So please welcome our speaker tonight. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to get this loaded up real quick. Think that's it. Um, I don't know which of these exactly to talk into. Um, can everybody hear me? Sweet. Well, thanks for having me. Um, this is a subject I'm always excited to talk about. It's something I don't hear many people go into kind of beyond like, oh, oyster mushrooms, they can eat nematodes. Um, there's really this insane range of strategies, a lot more things than nematodes that they eat and sort of like really cool ways it's played into like even modern taxonomic groups going back millions and millions of years, like well before plants were ever on land. Um, so I'm sort of gonna go through some of the things they eat, how they eat them, how this really blurs the line on what we even consider predation exactly. Um, I think I'm probably happy to take questions as I'm talking. Please, if there's like anything that you're wondering about or want elaborated on, or one time I gave this talk and about halfway through realized I never explained what a nematode was. So please let me know if anything like that comes up. Um, so predatory fungi in general, you know, mainly when we talk about fungi and their ecological roles, we're going over the three common ones, you know, mycorrhizal fungi that associate with trees, saprobic fungi that consume detritus, dead material, dead animals, things like that. Um, and parasitic, whether that be on fungi, other fungi, animals, plants, et cetera, um, predation is really not very well talked about. And I think in large part, that's because how they do it really sort of blurs the line between what we'd consider pathogenesis, like a disease, an infection, a parasitism on a living organism versus actual active capture, predation. When you think of something in the animal world that's a predator, like a hawk or a shark, it's pretty easy. We have this thing in our minds about like, well, it's an animal, it's equipped to kill other animals, it chases down, seeks, and eats prey. That's like simple, but it already gets a little messier there when you think about things that eat sessile, non-moving organisms. It's like a sea slug that eats coral, a predator, it's still technically running around with weapons, killing prey and eating it. Uh, it's like a filter feeding shark, still a predator. It's prey aren't doing a very good job of running and nothing's directly being gnashed apart, but it's still eating other animals. Fungi really managed to stretch the definitions of all this. Um, these are probably the least debated uh, predatory fungi. These are the ones that sort of created the definition because they have an active, very well-evolved, really well-adapted strategy. Um, so what you see here, um, this sort of long cylinder is a nematode. Um, most of the research on predatory fungi has focused on their interactions with nematodes because many of them cause crop disease, human disease, animal disease. They're movers and shakers ecologically. Um, so nematodes are mostly kind of microscopic, basically small, clear worms. The vast majority of them, um, they're not technically annelids, but the vast majority of them live in detritus, in natural habitats, just sort of cruising around, heterotrophically eating fungi, eating bacteria, eating other nematodes. Um, it's kind of 
anything and everything. Um, one of my favorite sort of like paraphrased quotes um, is that if you were to remove like everything in the world but nematodes, you'd still be able to make out every object, every highlight, the entire landscape, just because of the thin film of nematodes that is covering every surface and object around us. They're enormously important ecologically. They're basically in every niche, they're all over the place. And they manage to overlap with fungi in practically all of those spaces. Um, so what you see here is one of those nematodes uh, actually trapped in what you could call a snare, a fungal snare, a fungal loop. Uh, literature will often just call them constricting loops um, of arthrobotrys. This was the first form of sort of predation described in fungi. Um, this is Arthrobotrys um, anconia, but most of Arthrobotrys produce these snares and they work on a really cool mechanism. Um, but this was actually a dynamic that was described in the 1800s, late 1800s by a researcher called Zopp. Um, he sort of set the stage for investigating these relationships. Um, because they're active, um, this is the least debated form of predation. Really what you see is these three cells that form a ring. These rings are dialed in perfectly to the diameter uh, of the nematodes that they can actually physically restrain. Because these nematodes, once they realize they're trapped, will thrash, wiggle, destroy any mycelium nearby. Some of them have special mouth parts for destroying mycelium. Um, when a nematode slips its head through one of these loops, uh, mechanical and chemical stimulus the loop can actually smell that it's occupied. Uh, these three cells rapidly expand. There's a change in osmotic pressure. And you can see between that, that top left and bottom left that the space inside basically goes down to zero. Um, the constricting force of these loops is not only enough to hold the nematode in place, it often kills them, like breaks them apart. Um, after that, a small peg Within an hour, a peg comes out of that ring, punches in through the wall of the nematode, and eats it from the inside out. Um, and this is a very rapid process, too. Um, basically, from the second those are triggered, it is ready, whether it's dead or not, to punch into the side and start eating it. Mm -hmm. It sort of depends on the mechanism. Um, I'll go into it uh, actually pretty much just in a second. Um, this one is basically sized only for nematodes that are not going to be strong enough to break off the snare and run off and be fine. But there's others that have taken advantage of that and can take down much larger prey and basically get multiple advantages. So. I need to change the order of these slides. Um, this is an ancient strategy. Um, these rings are not the first form of nematode trapping uh, or just predatory structures. Um, this is a fossil from 100 million years ago um, of a nematode trapping fungus called Paleoanelis, um, which I love that. It basically means old ring. Um, this is a remarkably well-preserved specimen in amber you can see all the structures, analogous structures to modern day uh, trapping fungi, and these are actually non-constricting loops. So Arthrobotrys and a few other groups produce the constricting loops. Um, these non-constricting loops open up other strategies. So they'll be much, much bigger on average, and they'll capture nematodes that basically slip through them and wear it like a collar, um, but it doesn't constrict, it doesn't kill the nematode it breaks away. The nematode runs off carrying that collar. And this is something that is much too powerful for a mycelial network to hold in place. Um, that ring is basically a standalone spore. It's a dispersal unit. That nematode will carry that ring far away. That peg will come out, punch in, and either mechanically or chemically kill the nematode proceed with the colonization and eating part. So it still gets eaten from the inside out. 
And uh, conveniently, that, that species managed to take down a nematode it could never restrain, and it gets dispersal. That nematode runs off, gets digested, starts a whole new colony that forms more rings, and the cycle continues. Um, Arthrobotrys and many of the other snare formers can actually sustain themselves only on nematodes. Um, they're known to basically reduce, uh, because it's like a mostly species indiscriminate mechanism, and most nematodes hatching from eggs are small enough at some point for capture. Um, they're known to reduce nematode populations by 90 to 99% when they're in full hunting mode. Um, because of that, a lot of these have actually been considered for biocontrol of pathogenic nematodes. So I'll go into that a little bit more later on. Um, but both constricting loops and non-constricting loops, these structures fossilize really well. Um, so we've been able to date them at least 100 million years back. Um, but phylogenetically, looking at zygomycetes and ascomycetes, um, we can actually place likely formation of trapping structures about 466 million years ago, which really interestingly is right after nematodes evolved. So they basically found prey and stepped up to eat it. Um, keep in mind, this is also a period in time where there wasn't even developed plants on land. These, these dynamics of predator and prey were a much bigger niche, much bigger in determining survival of a species. Um, so predation in fungi likely goes back a very long time. Um, but again, sort of blurring that line on what exactly constitutes predation is the active or passive function of the snare, the deciding point on what's considered a predator. Um, there are a lot of other strategies, really. Everybody talks about the snares. Um, these are actually nets, which function sort of in a similar way to the non-constricting rings, um, but they're often either adhesive, poisoned, or both. Um, so these are capable of taking down much larger prey than a single snare could for the snare forming species. Um, they're also kind of low investment, and you can see sort of a evolutionary timeline on just having poisonous mycelium that kills nematodes, having weird contorted structures that accidentally trap nematodes, and having well-defined nets for catching nematodes specifically. Um, these are, again, mostly nematode-specific structures. Um, there's a few others that go back even further than the rings, nets, and snares. Um, but over here on the right, this is a cool mention. Um, these are asexual spores germinating, and before anything else, they're putting out a ring. So many of these species that are capable of feeding only on nematodes, the first thing they'll do is try to catch one as a food source. Um, some of these fungi, if they're in a really rich environment, will just eat detritus. They'll act as like saprobes. Um, if nitrogen specifically gets scarce and there's not many other sources of protein around, they're able to pull off this strategy and fill a niche that nobody else really can. Um, this is a really cool example of a nematode trapping structure, well, nematode attacking structure um, that we actually knew about for a long time before we ever figured out its function. So these are called stephanocysts. Um, they're produced in one genus, Hyphoderma, and we actually thought these were just really weird, fancy cystidia for a long time. We didn't know their function. We didn't know what they did. Um, come to find out later on, these are often poisonous um, dispersal agents for tacking onto nematodes. Um, so on the bottom, you can see a nematode that has picked up a ton of these stephanocysts. Um, I guess for context, these are crust fungi primarily that grow on decaying wood, which is rife with nematodes. Um, that ring of spikes that you can see in the upper left basically works its way into the skin of the nematode, functioning almost like a burr wood on fur. Um, some of these are toxic enough to kill the nematode after they've broken through that layer, but in many cases, these nematodes will pick up so many, they just run around until they're weighed down 
uh, as they're running around, you can see on the leftmost stephanosis, right on the mouth of the nematode, that it's germinated. So those are two little hyphae starting out, and you can't exactly make it out. Um, but that lower one has entered the mouth of the probably still living nematode, and we'll take that route inside prior to digestion. Um, and we had these structures described for a long time before we actually knew what they were for. Um, discovery of new structures for not only nematodes, but other prey has been constant. Um, we just don't have enough surveillance. Um, uh, so this one, the hyphoderma, is a basidiomycete. Um, Pre, for a long time, it was only ASCOs and zygos known to do this. Um, I'll sort of, when I get into the evolutionary bit and some of the mycology background, um, the first basidio that was discovered to predate on anything was kind of revolutionary and kicked off like a new wave of interest. Um, but this one's a basidio. Uh, this one's also a basidio that many of you know. Um, so these are actually the structures used to kill nematodes um, of Pleurotus, oyster mushrooms. Um, a lot of literature states that they eat nematodes and also the sort of like, like the two facts floating around that like fungi can use snares to catch nematodes and that oysters also eat nematodes often get kind of conflated. I've run into a lot of people who think that Pleurotus use snares when it's just the ascos and zygos using snares. They actually use something called a toxosis. Um, so on the upper left, there's this little peg sticking out. You can see a really thin halo around it. This is basically a bubble of extremely specialized neurotoxin uh, that will either paralyze or kill nematodes. Basically, a nematode will be strolling along. Um, and for context, these are the hyphae, and that's the size of the nematode. These are capable of taking down enormous nematodes. They're quite potent. Um, and the specificity of these compounds for different neurons in nematodes is actually a subject of research um, in a pharmaceutical context. But these toxocysts have a thin membrane around a droplet of these concentrated toxins. A nematode just has to bump into one of these. That thin shell ruptures, and it wicks onto the skin of the nematode, absorbs, and often kills or paralyzes it on the spot. Um, they're incredibly effective. And then there's no peg that comes out. The hyphal network will basically just seek and eat the nematode, whether it's alive or dead, usually entering it one of the two ends of its digestive tract. Um, a really interesting mechanism. This is what oysters use. Um, the research on those neurotoxins is very, very cool. There's some really, really cool toxins in there. Um, yeah. What are the units on the bottom? What, what the oh, gosh. I believe uh, that's a unit of time measuring uh, basically dispersal of the droplet after contact, um, if I'm recalling the study this came from. Um, what it details, and you don't see it all here, is the rupture of one of those toxocysts and then the nematode's reaction to it. So basically how antagonized it is and how quickly it pulls back, how far it gets from the colony before it freezes. Um, I want to say those are fractions of seconds, but I'd have to double check on that. Because um, if you lay them out frame by frame, that's the exploratory move of a nematode, basically. So a short period of time. Um, they are paralyzed or killed rapidly. Um, and then in the top two, you basically see the digestion of a nematode by the colony um, as it dissolves. Um, this was another really cool structure. Um, these are called spiny balls. Um, they didn't really get a great technical name in the paper that described them. Um, you might call them acanthocytes, but they're a bit different from the original description of acanthocytes. Um, these were produced by another mushroom a lot of you know, um, Caprinus commodus, the, the shaggy mane 
or lawyer's cap um, mushroom. We have been growing this on agar for like a hundred years now. And this was discovered just a couple decades ago. Um, it's the sort of thing where nobody was looking. And once we actually started looking, basically once we tortured and starved the colony a little bit, they formed these mystery structures. We didn't know what they did for a while. Turns out these are meant to shred any nematode that comes into contact with them. Um, depending on the species, they're not very hard to break into. And um, like the video doesn't really carry over well in slides, but nematodes that contact these or acanthocytes basically just seem to pop and disintegrate. There may be like venoms involved in that process. Um, but this is something where we cultured them for a long time without knowing these structures were capable of being formed and then didn't know what they did until we actually introduced them to nematodes to see what could happen. Um, which there's a researcher and a couple slides who basically set the foundation for that sort of exploratory work. Um, these are actual acanthocytes um, produced by the garden giant or wine cap, um, Strafaria rugoso annulata. Um, these function in an actual tear apart, impale, brutal kind of way. Um, the other ones just sort of tear through the outer layer of a nematode. These more stab and destroy. They're very, very sharp semi-crystalline cells. Um, this is actually on the cover of Mycologia, and this is why people are wondering if they may be venomous. Um, so on the bottom is an SEM image of the tip of an acanthocyte with remarkable similarities to snake fangs, scorpion stings, and a lot of other venom delivery systems. Um, so at the tip of these spiky semi-crystalline cells, there are often these pits, ridges, etc. And um, sometimes nematodes that make only partial contact with them are observed to die. Their clearing ability seems a little inconsistent with just mechanical damage. But so far as I know, we don't have a paper yet detailing what might be going on here. Um, but this is a great example of diversity in niche. You know, Strafaria rugosa annulata is a very, very aggressive wood eater, compost eater. It likes a lot of nitrogen. And when it's in a deficient environment is when it produces these. If it cannot get enough protein, enough nitrogen from its environment, that's when that structure is produced. Um, these hunting behaviors in mushrooms that have other ecological options are usually only seen in a state of nitrogen starvation. Um, these ones are not technically fungi anymore, but they're kind of too cool not to mention. Um, so these are gun cells produced by an oomycete, um, haptoglossa. Um, for context, oomycetes are now basically lumped into the protista mess. They're not considered kingdom fungi, um, but they're often referred to as water molds. Um, so this is another nematode-specific structure. These have all mostly been nematode-specific structures. These function in an incredible way. It is a harpoon. So basically, these uh, modal zoospore cells will land, glue themselves down to a surface. They have, in remarkable similarity to like jellyfish um, stinging cells, like cnidarian stinging cells, they have this spear-tipped harpoon with a cord coiled up. And this big structure at the back, 13, is basically a vacuole, like a space within the cell that just slowly swells and swells and swells like a balloon, building up internal pressure. There's a trigger mechanism at the tip. And I love that they called it a muzzle here. Um, as soon as a nematode or these have been observed killing rotifers as well, another micro animal, but seems to mostly be nematodes, um, it fires. Uh, this harpoon shoots out, stabs through into the body wall of the nematode. And because it's glued down, whether or not it's a fatal hit, it is tied to the surface. Um, hyphae or the equivalent of hyphae come out of that harpoon and again, eat it from the inside out. Um, it functions the same way as a whaler's harpoon to tie down a relatively massive 
uh, prey item compared to these these single cells. Um, they don't look near as impressive without like the TEM reference, but you can see the vacuole in there, um, the muzzle. Um, these will basically just be glued to little structures in a in an aquatic setting primarily. Um, now these are where you get out of nematodes. The photo is of a nematode because it is a great example of how brutal these traps are. Uh, these are glue traps. So these are probably the oldest form of uh, trapping mechanism formed by fungi. They've been seen in all three groups, main groups, so zygomycota, ascomycota, and basidiomycota. Um, because they function by adhesion, they're not nematode specific. Um, probably the oldest forms of this and their, their lineages that are still around today are uh, what you'd call amoeba phagus, amoeba phagus uh, fungi that basically put out baited sticky lollipops for amoebas to attempt to eat. And um, for context, amoebas are single cell, basically blobs. They don't have a cell wall. They don't have any real structure. They just kind of roll around and to successfully glue something like that down is a difficult task. Um, but these sort of baited sticky lollipops manage it. Uh, a number of other single celled organisms are susceptible to these. They can take down things uh, as large as nematodes, but they can take down rotifers, which are another micro animal, um, usually smaller than nematodes on average. They can take down water bears. Um, some of these have even been recorded uh, killing springtails, which are very, very large in comparison to these. Um, to put into context how well these adhesives work, so on the bottom, you can see this sort of hourglass-shaped cell, and similar to the toxocyst, this sort of halo around it. That's a droplet of glue, usually baited either with nematode sex pheromones, or, well, in the case of the nematode hunting ones, nematode sex pheromones or the pheromones they release when they find a meal. So they're actually drawing in nematodes for this. Um, there's that glue, baited glue layer. As soon as the nematode contacts that, there's actually a reaction between the adhesive and the nematode's cuticle. What you see here is a nematode that is basically pulled out of its own skin. So the sort of Nematode outline that you see there tied to the two knobs, that's the skin. And then the head of the nematode is actually sort of degloved, pulling away. Once you're tied to this, you're not going anywhere. Um, these adhesives are remarkably strong for their size and quantity because this is like far less than a microliter. This is a minuscule, like nano droplet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, no, they, it's, it's mimicry, essentially. They manufacture these in the same way that like truffles will manufacture pig sex pheromones. These have cracked the code on that. Um, and sort of in the same way, uh, like the pleurotus toxocysts are tailored to nematode nervous systems. Um, but this is just a great example of how brutal those sticky traps are, how effective they are, and the fact that they can take down single-celled or thousand-celled prey is really remarkable. Um, these structures are probably what allowed fungi to diversify into larger prey once it evolved and moved on land. Because um, again, these were around before terrestrial plants. Um, phylogenetic fossil evidence all suggests that predation, nematode fungus interactions, uh, protist, fungus interactions were trophically huge um, back before terrestrial um, autotrophs. Um, this is just a good description of some non-nematode prey. Um, on the left is a beautiful plate done by Dreschler. Um, this is a nematode or a amoeba killing sticky trap species. So these are nematodes at different stages of digestion. At the bottom, that sort of blob with the hyphae in the center, it's just consumed that. And then at the top, it's been hollowed out, eaten. Um, on the right, kind of just looks like a microscopic mess, is a variety of rotifers getting trapped by different sticky trap species. 
Um, really though, getting into the evolution, sort of the research that went on with these, um, the person who did the plate on the left uh, was Dreschler, Charles Dreschler, and his body of work is remarkable. He used relatively simplistic means to describe hundreds and hundreds of predatory fungi, of parasitic fungi. Um, there's a huge range of species that are endoparasites, so they may just spread by spore rather than having a network that attacks. There's species that only eat the eggs of nematodes or other species. He described pretty much the entire range. Um, after Zopf set the stage in the late 1800s, uh, I believe Dreschler's first works on predatory fungi was about 1930. Um, he moved from studying nematodes attacking crops into study of fungi that might eliminate them. Um, his methodology was so simple. He would take water agar, so a petri dish of water agar, um, commonly used for culturing different microorganisms, but this is a, a desert nutritionally. It is just water and gel. There's no nutrients offered. He would sprinkle just intact leaf litter samples onto it, the center of the dish, and the only nutrients available were what prey, what prey items, nematodes, water bears, rotifers, etc., were living in that leaf litter. And what he saw was a form shift. Basically, species like Caprinus, species like Arthrobotrys, would prioritize hunting nematodes once they were put into this environment that lacked other sources of nutrition. This simple methodology that can really be done at home by anybody with a pressure cooker and patience um, revealed countless species. He's had genera named after him uh, in regards to his work. He's had many, many species named after him. Um, after describing things, he uh, went on to biocontrol methods using nematophagus fungi for all kinds of crop pests and human pathogens. One of his biggest discoveries though, uh, was the first basidiomycete. So this is like mid 1900s, the first basidiomycete uh, ever described to prey on nematodes. So prior to that discovery, it had all been ascomycetes and zygomycetes. There was no known basidiomycetes. Um, this is actually an image of the genus he described. Um, it, it had abundant clamps everywhere when he cultured it. Um, and for context, Clamp connections are something that form basically between individual cells on hyphae, and they're a clear identifier of a basidiomycete. So they move it clearly out of zygomycota, ascomycota, and tell you exactly which phyla it's in. Um, he, after finding this species, which produced these distinct hourglass glue traps, um, found a few others and eventually decided to call them nematoctonists basically translates to nematode murderer or nematode killer. Um, he described the genus, um, set the defining characteristics, which are essentially glue traps and clamps. People weren't seeing other basidios eating, so everything got lumped into this. Um, because he established that they could be used in biocontrol in an agricultural setting, um, a lot of others picked up research. And what was really funny is Sort of at the time, people were going down all these avenues. There was a very exploratory aspect to mycology. People like Dreschler were culturing random samples from all over the world on agar just to see what happened. This isn't exactly something we see nowadays. Um, and he was doing this well before it was understood there was going to be agricultural applications. Um, there were two other researchers, Barron and Thorne, working in this realm. Um, one year, uh, the researcher Barron got sent a culture from farmland soil uh, that he identified as nematoctonous. It formed these sticky traps, it had the clamps, but it fruited on the petri dish. Previously, no sexual form of nematoctonous was known. We had only ever seen the sticky trap mycelium, which was incredibly effective. It seemed to want to just stick around as mycelium for a long time because it was so good at what it was doing. Um, after this fruited though, they had the chance to potentially either see what the sexual phase was like or connect it 
to an existing group of mushrooms. This is sort of a, an anamorph teleomorph situation where an anamorph or an imperfect fungi is what we would call something that doesn't seem to ever sexually reproduce. Uh, and a perfect fungi or a teleomorph is a mushroom, basically, something that produces sexual spores, undergoes meiosis, et cetera. Um, after sending this tiny, tiny little sad mushroom that formed on a petri dish around to a whole bunch of different mycologists, it actually um, eventually got identified as Hohenbohelia. Um, people know these as like the flower pot oysterling or the wood chip oyster. They're kind of these small, usually brownish, uh, what you'd call pleurotoid mushrooms. Um, once that connection was made, people started culturing, like cloning these species, germinating their spores, and found that for every Hohenbohelia they cultured, they found a nematoctonus. So people had basically been describing tropical and uh, temperate Hohenbohelia for decades, and people had been describing nematoctonus for decades. You had some researchers describing species of mycelium, and others describing species of mushrooms without making the connection. Once people started culturing these, all of a sudden they're getting linked together. We have both sides of the coin. Um, and so far, up to this day, every single Hohenbohelia that's been cultured has produced nematoctonus by Dreschler's standard. Now, because of the one name or one fungus, one name tenet in taxonomy, um, we don't like to keep two names for one species or one organism. Um, sequencing especially has made that a big deal. So technically, if the nematoctonus is connected to a known Hohenbohelia, it just goes under Hohenbohelia. Um, so the culturing of these species led to identification of a number of ecological roles. We see the full spectrum of what you'd call endoparasites, ectoparasites, species like uh, Hohenbohelia petaloides here, which are able to degrade wood. Um, they have pretty potent wood degrading activity, but they also produce traps. Um, then you get into other Hohenbohelia that basically only externally live on nematodes as spores. They spread as endoparasites. So they will, a nematode will basically encounter an adhesive coated spore the spore will enter through the mouth, colonize it, and then just produce a whole bunch more adhesive spores on the outside. Other nematodes will come along, maybe baited by pheromones or just investigate, touch one of these, and repeat the cycle. This is, again, where that predation thing kind of gets messy. Some of these species are intermediate. They might be mostly endoparasitic, or there might be a network that also produces sticky asexual spores. Mm -hmm. It, usually long enough to disperse the colony, um, but no, not for long. That's also another factor which makes the definition of parasite a little wiggy because they don't keep their hosts alive. Traditionally, that would sort of be called a, a parasitoid, similar to like parasitic wasps. Um, but in most cases, they are either poisoned or digested and die pretty quick. Um, but some of these Hohenbohelia, um, well, they're kind of stuck in nematoctonus, um, just seem to spread as parasites or parasitoids or pseudo predators. Um, they don't ever seem to produce fruit bodies. Because we don't have a sexual form, there's many species that are still just called nematoctonus. Um, when you look at the full spectrum from like Hohenbohelia petaloides, which fruits, which can degrade wood, but also eat nematodes, all the way down to these that are so specialized in consuming nematodes that they don't ever fruit. They're basically just asexual pathogens, predators, parasites on nematodes. Um, looking into this spectra, um, to, uh, Baron basically collaborated with a researcher called Thorne to use kind of a really new and novel means of justifying a taxa. So the Trichelomataceae was basically a, a wastebasket taxon for a lot of white-spored 
largely pleurotoid, so pleurotus-shaped mushrooms. And it was well understood that a lot of things were thrown in there that were not actually close to each other. Um, so like pleurotus, resupinatus, uh, hohenbohalia, a number of other groups were thrown in trichelomataceae with no real justification and nobody paying attention to them. Now, after noting, um, later on it was discovered that, that pleurotus were also uh, nematode killers. Um, they were the only two nematode eaters at the time, both in trichelomataceae. Barron and Thorne made the argument that this shared ecological role could very well put them closer to each other, maybe even separate from the rest of the family Trichelomataceae. Um, they were basically formulating this theory on ecological role, morphology, a few other factors. When they were sent a specimen of Nematoctinus, um, no connection to a fruit body yet, uh, that actually produced both sticky traps and pleurotus toxocysts. So when they sequenced that, it actually came out right at the base of Hohenbohalia, very basal. Um, they used that uh, along with a lot more sequence data, morphological data from Pleurotus and Hohenbohalia to say that this entire lineage basically diverged from the strategy of trapping and killing nematodes. What you see in Pleurotus is basically increased specialization in wood degradation uh, while still having a low investment strategy of killing nematodes as an extra nitrogen source, whereas Hohenbohalia really went down the path. You have specialists on nematodes there that never fruit. They're just hopping around in the bodies of nematodes nonstop. There's also ones like Petaloides that are still eating wood alongside nematodes. Um, and they basically erected an entire new family, Pleurotaceae, just containing these two based on all that, and it is still held up to this day. There's one other member in there, Agaricopedi, that was described way back, not really collected since. And so far as I can tell, nobody knows anything about it. Um, but this one really stood out to me because uh, they use behavior. Like the substrate specificity, sometimes niches can be used to justify taxa, but in this case, they made a really, really interesting activity argument, and it ended up panning out way back. Seeing that was really interesting. This is sort of something I came across while just researching different culture methods um, for different fungi, different uh, nematode and predatory fungi, and seeing this whole thing from like Zop's paper, Dreschler's research, onto Baron and Thorne's research, it was very much the sort of thing where they were constantly giving commentary on each other's work, adapting things, and it eventually crystallized into this Pleurotaceae that still stands to this day and eventually helped separate a lot of things out of Trichelomataceae. But I'm not going to get into the taxonomy on that mess. Um, but again, I wanted to emphasize what sort of led from Dreschler's simple, simple work to all the other basidios that we discovered um, consuming fungi, you know, the acanthocytes, the spiny balls, the stephanocysts, was people basically taking Dreschler's method and stressing fungi out. Um, we just had to do surveillance where we tortured them a little bit, introduced nematodes, because some of these structures won't even be produced by the mycelium until they literally smell nematodes. They won't invest in structures to kill them unless they know they're there and they're hungry. Um, and that sort of exploratory work, literally just starving things, seeing what happens, um, culturing intact leaf litter samples, uh, specimens, that's not exactly work that's funded nowadays. We need people to sort of just starve things and see what happens, which is why usually near the end of this talk, I advocate for how simple the water agar method that Dreschler used is. It's very much stood the test of time, and we're likely to only continue finding predatory fungi um, if we just do this surveillance. You know, these are all species that were around and cultured, cultivated, explored in other aspects of research for a very long time before finding these like remarkably well-adapted structures. Um, I definitely advocate for uses like that. And 
it has uses too. Um, nematode killing fungi have been used successfully for biocontrol of human pathogenic nematodes, of crop pathogenic nematodes. That's probably the biggest application because a lot of these can basically be soil fungi in a field until root knot nematodes or root gall nematodes show up, until other pathogenic nematodes show up. Then they can produce structures and wipe out 90 to 99% of the population. Um, and this doesn't even super go into the entire category of toxin producing nematode, uh, nematode eaters because it's, it's messy. Some of them have contact toxins where nematodes just touch them and die. Others can basically pump out a metabolite that just nukes the entire area, wipes out all nematodes that are anywhere within the contact distance of water touching the mycelium. And in some cases, that's self-defense. In most cases, they're going to mop up all those bodies after the nematodes fall. Um, so I suppose um, if anybody had questions really on any of this, I'm happy to talk. If you want to know more about the culture methods for the water agar, et cetera, um, if anybody had questions, happy to take them. So it varies um, for plates. You can actually pour water agar really thin. Um, so like just a really, really thin layer. Make sure you use like parafilm so it doesn't dry out. Um, and you might actually want to consider kind of gluing your litter sample down with a drop of agar on top of that. Um, after it's sealed up, you can basically flip that upside down and the medium magnification, uh, the 10x on a lot of microscopes, you can actually look straight through the agar onto the, the opposite side and see the surface, see these structures, see what's going on. And nematodes are quite large. Um, sort of Dreschler's experimental surveillance way was just seeing if there was random dead nematodes lying around with no known cause. And then subculture from there introduced known cultures of ex nematode species and taking things like kill rates. Do nematodes die in the presence of this fungus? And then observation to see how they're doing it. Um, there's, again, sort of the toxin realm. There's some fungi which nematodes just seem to not be capable of surviving around. Not exactly. Sort of going into um, oh god. Uh, sort of going into like this plate here, that drawing on the left. The vast majority of the descriptions on the diversity here was by Dreschler in drawing form. Um, you can dig through his papers and see astounding ranges of morphology. Um, you can see pretty much the entire range in ASCOs, zygos, and then later on basidios of the structures they produce, but the research isn't exactly funded on a large scale. There's not really a good archive or database. Um, what you can do is basically document everything you see with photographic evidence. Um, if you're capable of, you can order um, St. Arabides elegans, nematodes from like Carolina Biological. Um, if you can get actual kill rate data, that'd be great. But for the most part, you can just starve common uh, basidiomycete cultures in the presence of nematodes and see what happens. Um, that alone is an observation that you can just compile over time. At LCC, I basically built a compendium of, uh, this wasn't nematodes, um, but basically mycelial morphologies during mating, sexual development, um, clamp structures, nuclei counts, things like that, just as an archive, basically for reference or if I get around to publishing some of it someday. Um, getting the photos and observations, writing it down is at least the first step. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, of course, that there would be actual Yeah. Um, so sort of like mycoremediation, 
there's been specific contexts where success rates were extremely high. Um, in particular, some of the sticky trap species that can live in aquatic environments dealt with the um, aquatic like dispersal larvae of, um, oh gosh, what is it called? The, um, the fireworm, the foot nematode they deal with in Africa and the Middle East. Um, high kill rates, very effective. There was also sticky trap species that were capable of killing the copepods they disperse in. Um, application of this never really happened. Um, pretty much the only wide scale application that showed a lot of success was Dreschler's work on uh, nematoctinus and arthrobotrys in controlling root gall nematodes. And that was like 1950s and 60s. Um, the research on that, again, is really good. Um, what I advocate for in a household setting is uh, you can actually, because it's so aggressive and extremely good at killing nematodes, you can actually slurry Hohenbohelia petaloides and apply that to soils. Even if there's no wood around, it can persist in soil and massacre nematode populations, basically anywhere it's present. Um, unless you're doing large-scale agriculture, most nematodes aren't a problem for gardeners. Um, but as to why it hasn't been applied, I'm not quite sure. Um, human crop and uh, like animal control have all shown really good results. So I'm a little unclear on why it hasn't spread a bit more. But part of it has to do with these fungi sort of being cosmopolitan as it is. Um, usually their kill rates will be lowered because they all actually compete with each other. Um, different strategies will uh, compete at the same time for different stages of nematodes. Uh, nematodes can build up resistances to some of the toxins and get co-resistance. There's sort of all these dynamics that limit their natural efficacy. Um, you know, otherwise nematodes just wouldn't be able to survive in soil anywhere. Um, also, a lot of these fungi will eat other stuff if it's around. Um, it's only when they start to starve that they'll produce nematode trapping structures. Um, there's a lot more like the oomycete um, haptoglossa. There's a lot more in aquatic settings that are like just hunters. Mm -hmm. I love to eat oyster hunt fungi. If you let them sit around for more than a day, it's Mm -hmm. And me, I'm a biologist. It's usually more than one species. And if they're oh, yeah. so good at eating these things, why are there so many that are crawling out and still living? And then the second part of the question, commercially, when we buy them at a grocery store and bring them home, stuff doesn't crawl out. Can mm -hmm. you talk about that for a little bit? Sure. Um, so sort of to set it off, um, the larvae that you see crawling out of mushrooms are basically always either fly larvae, like fungus gnat larvae, or beetle larvae, um, neither of which are taken down by oysters using the toxicist strategy. The toxins they have in those are very specialized for nematode nervous systems. So, And they're also mycelial. Um, the fruit bodies don't really have these structures or the nematode killing capability. Um, some of them just have toxic cells in general, but that's like nematoctinus or other zygos. Um, they also, as to why you would see it in the wild and not store-bought, these eggs are usually deposited pretty much the second the mushroom exists. Like the second it forms and breaks out from the substrate, eggs will be deposited everywhere. And depending on temperatures, they can develop anywhere from like 12 hours to like a week later in winter. And it's usually accelerated when you bring it inside your warm house if it's the fall. Um, Were the commercial people putting on three, four, five bad stuff you, you couldn't eat? Button mushroom farmers often do use quite a lot of pesticides to deal with fungus gnats specifically. So those are mycetophilids, and uh, they're horrible for the button mushroom industry specifically because they can also eat the heavily composted, heavily manured substrate they grow on in the same way they can plague like indoor plants. Um, that's an area where people don't often talk or think about the massive amount of pesticides that are used to deal with fungus gnats in mushrooms, and they don't really get washed off in the same way as plants either. Um, there's been a few cases of like worker toxicity there as well. 
So far as I know, that's mainly button mushrooms. Um, I don't know if the practice is as common with wood loving species like oysters. Mm -hmm. Um, there's probably a lot of different papers, um, but it's really simple. It's just agar without any nutrients added. So I use 15 to 20 grams of agar per liter. You just boil that up and sterilize it like normal agar. That's it. Um, just agar without nutrients. Um, if anybody wanted like a specific walkthrough, um, I could probably give like my email. Um, but it's the sort of thing where like, it's commonplace enough, like people usually, when they use agar, unless it's a special recipe, it's just like WA, water agar, or PDA, potato dextrose agar, MEA, malt extract agar. It's just kind of one of the base agars used in mycology. Um, but it's just agar without nutrients, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you were to stress many of the mushrooms that you know already, what do you personally think that you need? How many do you think should carry that signal of interest? Well, so far we've found a number of different mechanisms, acanthocytes, toxocysts, uh, stephanocysts, like wildly different mechanisms in phylogenetically pretty distant groups. Um, just going by how old this strategy is and how, at least in the zygos and ascos, we kept finding them everywhere we looked, um, I think probably a lot. I mean, the first places to start would be, I think, relatives of ones we know. So like Strafariaceae would probably be a good place to start, um, just with the acanthocytes produced by uh, Strafaria rugoso annulata. Um, there's a lot of species in in that family that also produce really wild, weird asexual spores in a lot of different ways. And there's good evidence suggesting that like the toxocysts produced by Pleurotus are actually derived from asexual spores. So this is an asexual spore structure that basically just diverged, lost most of its cell wall and turned into a poisonous bubble. Um, and there's like direct lines to draw there between the sticky spores that the nematoctinus produce on the other side of Pleurotaceae. Both of them show spore morphology changes. The stephanocysts probably derived from asexual spores too. So I'd say any group that has weird asexual spores is probably a great place to start. I think it's a lot more common than we know. We just don't starve enough basidios. Mm -hmm. Uh, they don't shed like that. Yeah, they go through growth stages, but that is not at all what it's supposed to look like. Um, yeah, that is a nematode in serious distress. Um, degloved and soon to be eaten. It'd be like pulling the skin off a finger. Like it's, yeah, it's, it's more like its whole head. It's not doing very well. Um, but it also kind of reinforces like they, they thrash around with enough force after capture to do things like that, to literally tear themselves apart, um, which is why I think it's really cool to see methods that get around that, like the non-constricting rings that assume it's not going to be able to hold on to a giant nematode, or the net structures or the toxin structures that can take down large prey without uh, necessarily physically restraining them, um, I find really, really interesting. It sort of emphasizes how, like, I think part of the difficulty in defining exactly what this is, like, for one, fungi don't move. They're immotile other than a few weird spore stages. Um, it's hard to apply something like the word predator, which has largely been defined in an animal context, to this. 
Um, this is distinctly different from a lot of parasitisms and uh, pathogenesis scenarios that you see fungi in. And especially when you look at groups like Nematoctinus and Pleurotus, you kind of see this range from like how parasite for, you know, Hohenbohalia nematoctinus isn't clear cut. There's species that do the endoparasite thing. There's species that do both at the same time. Um, there's others that just stick them down. Um, there's other animals that set traps that we consider predators. Um, I would argue that they're derived enough that I like to apply the predatory definition to a lot of these strategies, but it's pretty contentious. It's definitely a gray area. And like with the non-fruiting asexual nematoctinus, a lot of people just sum those up as parasites or endoparasites. Oh, yeah. You're... Oh, absolutely. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, surprisingly. Uh, the rhiny chert. Um, so they can actually leave impressions in like uh, non-transparent like rock records. Um, some of this is manifested in like uh, petrified wood, um, where you'll basically have fungal cells um, kind of 2D visible. If you do cross sections of these, uh, the entire realm of paleomycology is kind of insane, and they do a lot with very little. Um, some of the methodologies used, um, there's different x ray methods, there's all kinds of different imaging. Now that we're getting to a point where we can, uh, like, actually chemically fingerprint some of the fossils we see, even after things have mineralized, we're now getting to a point where we can differentiate algae, fungi, plant, early plant cells um, pretty accurately. And we're realizing that fungi had a lot more of a place and a lot more large structures uh, than we realized. Um, but I was very surprised to learn that we can actually see loops in things like the Rhiny Chert. Um, but amber is probably the earliest and best examples to see clear morphology because they're still 3D. All right. I think that's it for questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you liked it. The oh god. Smaller one? It's so intelligent. Yeah. And it just latches on and then freezes away. Yeah. It's like a way to take down big prey and disperse. Yeah, and disperse and say no, I love it. It's super cool. Yeah. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you. Yeah. You are? Every week's a little experiment. My boyfriend was watching. What's up, everybody? Thank you so much for attending tonight's meeting. We are going to do this every week. I'm going to, or every month, that is. Uh, I'm going to jump in here and do my best to present our meetings online. It's a work in progress, so apologies if the image isn't good or, you know, the sound quality, but we're working on it. And thank you so much for coming out. Uh, check out Oregon Mycological Society online and uh, become a member today. All right. Yeah. That's
online. It's like, $100 to take a class. So I'm like, oh, well, she's like, well, I do it for 50 bucks per member. So keep your eyes out because I'll have to look like that. It's crazy. And I'm like, at the end of the school year right now, and I'm um, no. But during yeah. the summer, that was the awesome yeah. Yeah. This is your pen. Yeah. Thank Blessing you. I have it. Yeah. And I have yeah. this pen wow. on. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Did, yes. So now this is tape, right? Did yeah. we take this? I don't know. I know. Uh, you know, I don't know either. Like one of the things I've dialed in. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's uh, so going a little bit. My boyfriend was watching it the other end. He was like, sound like, sounds great. Oh, good, good. Uh, next time I'm going to see, at the beginning, I'm going to tilt the camera and see if I can get it. Yeah. But, but we might, we might uh, see if we can get a uh, plug yeah, time for it. Like I said, just... That's, and, and that's all the thing. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, but it's nice to get a little bit of 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 a I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. That's you. I don't know. 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 I don't I don't know. 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 I don't like a gorilla. Yeah, Here he comes. I'm like, oh, yeah, can we do that? Yeah, I can put it on. Just things. about anything. Yeah. Uh, any so, angle, it's uh, yeah. So, you know, it's it's great. great. It's super nice. It's super fun. Uh, look up I'm sure you the uh, Yeah, um, um, adjustable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah, I can put it on, you know, a fence post or whatever. Yeah. You can wrap it around a tree. Exactly. Super, super yeah. helpful. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love it. Okay, I'm pretty sure. Okay, so I'll definitely be on the lookout. Yeah, awesome. Right on. No, that's the uh, Dyer's calling yeah, for. Yeah. I've seen, huh? Yeah. Now this they used for dye. Uh, yeah, when they're really fresh, they use for, them for dye. I think you can still get color out of that phase, but not as, as vibrant. And, okay. Yeah, fabrics and yarns. Yeah. Yeah, coral abundant right now. That's the dyer's policy. Oh, coral doesn't dye about dry. The spring coral, especially. Oh, okay. Gigantic. Yeah. Huge. Yeah, that's like. Uh, I didn't, but I I, should, I saw plenty of it this weekend. Yeah. It's a, it's a beaut. Yeah. I think this is a total fungus. You know, the one here. The song, half deals. I think it's all dried out. It's a polypore. Oh.